Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Episode 81, Games for the Kids. This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons, such as Kelsey. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Last time, we talked about mental games, word games and board games. Games that Māori played that didn't really require the need to leave the house to play. Today, we talk about games that were pretty much exclusively played by tamariki. So, no complicated board games, but rather games we would expect to see children playing either in the fields or just outside the whare. Like a lot of the games we've talked about, these were meant to teach skills as well as entertain, but they were obviously played in such a way that was appealing to a much younger demographic. Most of this information comes from Elston Best, so do with that what you will, but he also describes actually quite a lot of children's games in his book, Games and Pastimes of the Māori. So I'm only going to go through some of the ones that caught my eye and that I found quite interesting. In the latter half of the episode, we'll also talk a little bit about Māori interactions with European games. A lot of games involve the use of small objects, one of those being spinning tops. These were made of stone and sometimes inlaid with power shell to give them that extra pizzazz. Māori spinning tops were slightly different in that they were long and cone-shaped compared to the more short and wide European-style ones. The game that was played with these was essentially Beyblades, where an arena was dug into the ground with bumps and ridges and other obstacles put in. The tops were then spun in the arena, and whichever one stopped spinning first, lost. Some tops would have a harakeke rope on them, changing them into whipping tops. The rope helped to spin the top more easily and get it going. There were also the humming tops, which, unlike what their name might imply, made a high-pitched sound that best equates to when Māori would mourn the dead, though I do wonder whether that was an exaggeration. However, he does say that sometimes humming tops would be substituted for actual singing for the dead if no one of sufficient skill was available. What he doesn't mention, of course, is how these tops were made and how they produced the sound. Karetao were another small object that may not have been used to play games as such, but was certainly a device for entertainment for children. Essentially, they were toys kinda like puppets. Small, occasionally intricately carved wooden figures of humans that had some sort of long handle underneath that allowed someone to hold them. The whole thing would be made from a single piece of wood, Except for the arms, which were made separately and attached via a loose cord to the shoulder and then tied behind the figure. This allowed for a degree of manipulation of the arms by tightening or loosening the cord. So, one hand would hold the handle and shake the karetao a little, while the other hand tugged on the cord to make the arms move. All of which combined together would give the effect of the figure performing a haka. Songs or chants were also sung while playing with these toys too, which added to the overall effect. Kura Winniwini is a bit of an interesting game involving hiding a string. A number of players would seat themselves in two rows facing each other, with one person at the front who would be trying to guess where the string is. The first person in the rows would put one end of the string in their mouth to indicate to the guessing person where the string started. The rest of the string was passed down the middle of the two lines, with each person taking it in their hand with their palms facing down, and using their thumbs to move it along. So the guesser couldn't entirely see what was going on. The string didn't have to make it all the way to the end though. The game of course was to guess where it had ended, so it was common for it to end up part way along the row of people, and everyone just be imitating the movements to look like they were gripping the string. As such, it was possible that the string may have almost been entirely collected by someone up the front, or even have it get to the end and loop back up the row if the string was long enough. Apparently, 
The game was actually pretty hard, as players were often very good at concealing the string and disguising their movements. As with other games, songs were sung as the string was moved, possibly with some sort of rhythm that was followed. But what about games that didn't involve any equipment? Well, there was plenty of those too. For example, Māori seem to have had their own version of cat and mouse, called Wii. I'm not sure if this was a Kiwi thing or whether other places in the world also played this game, but it was basically where kids would stand in a circle and hold hands, with one player being the mouse and another the cat. The cat was trying to catch the mouse, who would run into the circle as allowed by the other kids moving their arms up, whereas they would deny the cat, or at least they would attempt to. It was a pretty simple game and didn't really have any sort of end point. The Māori version, on the other hand, had one kid play the kiori, the rat, and the other plays the papaki, which possibly meant the slapper or the swatter. The rest of the kids would line up in two parallel lines, or some similar shape, and the kiori player would run around and try not to get caught by the papaki player. The catch was that the papaki had to follow the same route as the kiori, otherwise they were out. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any info on how the rest of the kids were involved in their two lines, so my assumption is that the kiori and papaki would move through them in some way. There also seems to have been a variation of this game that is a combo with Duck Duck Goose and Go Home Stay Home. A game that actually involved a mild amount of slapping was Toi Koi Koia. This was a game where each child would close their hand and outstretch downwards their index finger, as if they were pointing down at something. They would then stack their hands on top of each other, their index fingers touching the back of the hand of someone else, with each child stacking up. Then a short little song would be sung, only a couple of lines, and when it was done, everyone would snatch their hands behind their back or try to tag someone else's hand. The idea was to not get touched or slapped, otherwise you were out. The use of hands was, of course, popular in children's games, as they're good implements for doing all sorts of simple procedures. Hapitawa was a two-player game which one child would open their hands and put them together in front of them, as if they were playing slaps. The other player would then run their hands along them as if stroking them, saying a chant or singing a song. At the end of this, the player asks, Me ahakoya? Which means, what shall be done? The player that has their hands together then either replies me whakaroa, spear him, or me patu, strike him. If the player chooses to be speared, they get a quote, light box on the ear, end quote. If they choose to be struck, nothing happens to them, which best notes is a quote, curious reversal of the decision, end quote. The second player, the one who would be doing the striking, would then force the first player's thumbs up and away from their fingers, as the hands were still together, saying, he hape kumara, hape meaning oven. They would then move on to the index fingers, forcing them up and away from the middle fingers, saying, he hape taro, and continuing on down the hand, referencing each oven of kiridu, koko, and kaka. All of these hapi are related to the initial chant or song as they are referenced in there as well. The player with their hands together then cups his hand while the other player quickly moves into them with a finger and thumb and retracts them as fast as they can. The idea being that the first player tries to snap their hands shut to catch the thumb and finger. If they are caught, the game ends. Other variations of this game saw different chants being used or the finger catching phase being in slightly different positions. As mentioned at the start, this is really only the surface of the games that Māori children played. There were so many other pastimes, such as rope swinging, throwing hoops, skipping stones, racing toy waka, chewing gum, which they would pass around with each other, hide and seek, or even just building stuff like rafts and seeing if it floats. Anything you can imagine kids doing outside and messing around, they were probably doing it. So that was some children's games that I found kind of fun and interesting. I think it's really cool to learn about these rather more quote-unquote mundane aspects of life, as it really paints a much clearer picture of what people were doing just in their 
everyday lives, or what you might expect to be doing if you grew up in this time and place. Now though, I want to talk a bit about Europeans and some of their games, and how they interacted with Māori culture. Best himself notes that many early European explorers and missionaries that came to Aotearoa didn't really take all that much interest in Māori games, or things that they did for entertainment in general. The haka was really the only exception, so they didn't record very much about these aspects of Māori life. One missionary only noted, quote, There are numerous other pastimes. Men and women walk on stilts, boys stand on their heads in rows, moving their leaves through the air, kites, fashioned of reeds in the shape of birds, are flown in windy weather. When bathing, there is a game which consists in seeing who can keep longest underwater. Men wrestle and jump from high poles into deep water. The leapers before jumping sing, This is the precipice over which I cast myself, even to Toriakura, and am thus separated from the beloved one spring. Swinging over chasms by ropes attached to poles is another amusement. Spears are discharged at objects from slings, people and canoes race, Trees are climbed, and mimicry and ventriloquism are practiced as pastimes. End quote. That was pretty much it. No descriptions of these things, no in depth analysis, no real meat of it, just listing a whole bunch of stuff in a really weird order and weird syntax. Best also specifically calls out the well-known explorer Polak, who had been living in the Bay of Islands for many years, as being pretty shit at recording what games Māori played, and could have written a much more comprehensive list. As for what kind of European games Māori quite liked, you can probably take a guess based on what we've seen in other areas, such as music, where Māori tended to gravitate towards things that were similar to what they already knew. So games like cards, drafts, possibly hopscotch, boxing and football were all introduced from Europe and Māori were quite big fans of. And if you've listened to the previous few episodes, you should have a fair idea of why these are the games that Māori took an interest in. Probably the only mildly surprising exception to this, at least according to Best, was chess. Though he doesn't elaborate as to why. Boxing was actually a bit of an interesting one, as Best explains that Māori essentially had two modes. One was like our own boxing, punching with a clenched fist with the intention of striking with the knuckles, whereas the other was again striking with a fist, but trying to hit with the outer side of the fist, the side with the little finger. This was supposedly done when fighting with a close relative, so presumably the idea was that by striking with the more fleshy part of the palm on the side, it would do less permanent damage. In general, it seems that boxing wasn't done much for sport, but mostly for disagreement with a relative, and there's not much evidence to suggest that competitions were held. Wrestling seems to have been the much more popular option. If you were paying attention closely to that quote from the missionary just before, you may have heard that Māori used slings. This is a fairly interesting comment, since unlike other Polynesian cultures, rock-throwing slings weren't really a thing in pre-European Aotearoa, with only a possibility that they saw limited use in warfare. There is some oral stories that allude to slings being used, but as far as I can tell, Western science hasn't been able to further confirm these. In saying that, Best does talk about how slings were a popular item to play games with. So this whole thing does seem to be a bit of a grey area, but it does seem to suggest that slings at some point did exist in pre-European Māori Aotearoa. The slings themselves were pretty similar to what was used throughout the world, a cord with a little woven square or oval part where the stone would sit, which could then be whirled around to flick the stone in the intended direction. Another way would be to have a long bendy stick stuck in the ground with a cord attached. One person could hold the cord taut and bend back the stick, while the other held the rock against the stick facing towards the target. The person with the cord would then await the signal to release it, flinging the stick forward and hurling the rock. 
This implement was possibly used in sieges, potentially with the rock being heated in a fire first before it was flinged over the walls of a pa. Spears could also be thrown in a similar way, by taking a stick, tying a cord to it, which was then tied loosely to a short spear. The stick was then held and flung forward, the spear coming away from the cord and flying towards the target as the stick with the cord was held onto. This technique was also apparently used in battle, which makes the whole thing rather interesting, since it means that Māori did seem to have some kind of ranged weaponry to a degree, but for some reason never made the jump to a form of bow and arrow type technology. Whether that just be because the resources at hand weren't good for it, or whether it just wasn't needed. It's a bit of an interesting mystery that I hope to look into a bit more when we get to talking about Māori warfare. Next time. It will be the first of three parts covering arguably the most famous aspect of Māori culture. We have mentioned it briefly throughout Hans so far, but we will be diving deeper into its social importance, how it is performed, and an entire episode detailing the history of the one that everyone knows because of the All Blacks. That's right, we're finally going to be talking about Haka. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can find my email and social media on historyaltero.com. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. You can also find helpful resources there, like transcripts, sources, and translations for some of the Te Reo Māori we have used. You can help support Hans through Patreon, buying merch, or giving us a review. It means a lot, and helps spread the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. As always, hari tu atu, oki tu mai. See you next time.